We are starting a new chapter in our study in the epistle to the Romans. It is chapter 2. So we start chapter 2, verse 1. Read along with me as we look now into Romans chapter 2. It starts by saying this, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to the truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. We stop there. The verse that I just read, not knowing it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. This will be this, the verse that we base this time on. The, the foundational verse of our time in the Word will be the goodness of God leading us to repentance. An amazing truth that we just read. Amazing revelation of who God is in the process of us coming to Him. There are a lot of themes that are going to be unfolded in Romans, Romans 2. A couple of them we already could pull out of this. There are some really good sermons waiting for us in what I just read. One of them is this incredibly important and heavy topic about the hypocrisy that so often exists in the eyes or in the, in the viewing of people who are judging one another. This, this topic is drawn out as as Paul is now entering into a second group of people. We won't spend our time looking at that theme, but it's important for us to know why Paul says this, because it does point us to what we just read in God's goodness leading us to repentance. It is a topic that comes up because of Paul now introducing the second audience of his letter. The book of Romans, again, is written as an invitation for people to understand this good news message of what is called the gospel of God in him, the way that he is bringing people back to himself. It's power of God, of salvation, to save people, to justify people. And the, the reason that's good news is because all of us, outside of God's grace, outside of this good news message accepted by faith, we are ungodly underneath the judgment of God. The wrath and the anger that God has against sin is something that all of us have to give an answer for. And to make this case or make this indictment against anyone who's outside of the grace of God, Paul in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18, says, think about it in terms of the ungodly or the immoral or the irreligious. They, they are far from God. They're, they're not within the, the boundaries of the Jewish tradition. And so obviously they are people who are outside of God's righteousness, but they are without excuse because they actually know God in their hearts. And they express the truth of God in their pursuit of unrighteousness. So they need the gospel too. That's the first audience that Paul is addressing. Now enter Romans 2, the second audience. The second audience is people who may have heard what we talked about all through our study in Romans 1, about the unrighteousness, the ungodliness of men, and the list of sins that Paul lays out to let people know that even though they're outside of the tradition of religion, they are still underneath the judgment of God because they do all sorts of things that is not good, not how they were created. And the religious amongst us or amongst Paul's uh, audience might say, exactly, of course, they're under God's wrath. Of course God's angry at irreligious people. Of course he's angry at unrighteousness and sinners. And the, the letter now points its aim to the second audience. And Paul says, now wait a minute, don't judge them though. Don't judge them because in your judgment of them, if you think that you are somehow better than them, you are a hypocrite. And that's how one of those themes come out. A second theme you might find is that only God is a perfectly righteous judge. So don't even judge. It's another sermon waiting to be preached. It is all now pointing us to Romans chapter 2, verse 4, where Paul says, it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. The reason this is such an important thing for us to really meditate on and understand is because as soon as we understand the position that we are in outside of God's grace, there should be a heavy burdened question on our heart. What do we do? 
what are we supposed to do about it? If we're the immoral, ungodly, unrighteous, far off, outside of a religious background, but we realize that we too have to deal with the guilt and shame of all the things that we've done in our past, we should be saying, what do we do? And Paul is now saying to even those who are within the system, for him it's the Jewish audience, it's not the Gentiles, not far off, it's the Jewish people who are close in. He says, don't you know that repentance is something you need to know too? It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. So we are going to talk about the mechanics, the process, the amazing good news that is just read in the simple truth that it is because God is good and it is because God is taking part in the process of our repentance in leading him to himself that repentance happens. That we can go from people who are going away from God towards anger and wrath and destruction. We can actually turn and go towards him. That is the simple mechanics of repentance, going away and now changing our mind, changing our direction to go towards him. And the reality of how all of that happens is all found in the goodness of God. We have to understand that. For wherever audience you find yourself, we have to point the good news message continually coming back to God's goodness and not our own. So I want to look at this in two simple ways. It's, the, it's God's goodness and it's God's leading. And those are the two themes that I'm going to draw out of what Paul says about the repentance that we have because of God. To do that, I want to look at Luke chapter 15. It is where we will spend the rest of the sermon for a couple reasons. Turn to Luke 15. Let me explain to you why this is such an appropriate way for us to draw out the truth of what Paul is revealing in Romans chapter 2 couple reasons that it's, it's, it's really nice for our study this morning. One is that in Luke chapter 15, we're going to read about a story, and the story is chiefly centered around a father. That in, the, the, in, in us understanding what, what repentance is all about, and in the, the way that Jesus, in the most intentional and, and probably largest way that he speaks on the matter of repentance, he tells a story about a father. Us understanding the mechanics of us coming back to God is going to point us to the heart of God as a father. And I like this specifically for this day because we celebrate fatherhood. Today we celebrate fatherhood. We've prayed for fathers. We're going to hopefully spend time sons and daughters with fathers. And I am always grateful for any opportunity I can to take a theme that's already kind of in the air. This is not a church calendar theme like Christmas or Easter, but it's a theme of our culture, and we're going to talk about it a lot today. And we're going to think about it. We're going to say Happy Father's Day a lot. And what the Bible says is everything that we love about having fathers and the love that a father shows a child and the way that it's something that should be honored is really pointing us to who God is. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus says, you fathers knowing how to give good gifts to your children. If your child is hungry, you don't give them stones. If you know how to do that, being evil, how much more does your father in heaven know how to give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? What that is saying is, what you know about being a father is just there so you can understand things about God and his love towards you. And I like talking about something like fatherhood on a day like today, knowing that when we say Happy Father's Day, not everyone feels internally happy in, inside because not all of us have a great template of what it means to have a loving father. Some of us don't have fathers to celebrate with here in this sanctuary. Some of us have fathers that have a broken relationship, that it, it, it does more harm in our heart than good. But what I want to do is to draw those of you who may relate to that in and say, Father's Day is a picture of something way bigger than what you've experienced in the relationships of this, of this earth. Father's Day is going to point you, and I hope that we all leave here loving God as a father more. He is a good father, and the story that we're going to read is going to reveal the heart that he has for all of us to be brought near to him. The second reason that I love this story on this day as we study Romans 2 is because Contrary to what you may think about the story of this father and what is often called the prodigal son, it is not just about one son. If, in fact, as we, as we begin to read this, if you look at Luke chapter 15, verse 11, it says, A certain man had two sons. This is a story that Jesus is going to tell about the heart of the father towards those who are repenting, and it's not about one lost son, and that can be somewhat misleading. In fact, in my, in my Bible, the headline in this, added later, 
is called the parable of the lost son. It's leading us to believe that this is really a story about one son and the relationship that he has in coming back to his father. But in fact, this is a story about two sons. It's about a younger son and about an older son. And the reason this is pointed out and the reason we're studying this is because this is in fact perfectly paralleled with what Paul is trying to communicate in Romans chapter 1 and in chapter 2. The younger son that Jesus is going to tell this story about is, is a son that we can, can look at is really just turning his back on the father. We're going to read this story. The younger son comes to the father. He really just wants everything he can get so that he can leave and live a life of his choosing, doing whatever he wants to live lavishly, turning his back on the father to live in what might be considered unrighteousness. And through this, he finds himself way far off in a distant land. Through his pursuits, he finds himself broken. He finds himself in need for restoration and rebuilding. This is perfectly aligned with what Paul is describing about ungodly people in Romans chapter 1. They're way far off. They've turned their back on God. They're broken in their sin. Now, the important thing is to realize that to understand Romans chapter 2, you have to read the rest of this parable because there is an older son, and the older son never leaves. He stays within the father's household, and he's loyal, and he's faithful, and he serves his father. And there's something that's happening in the interaction between the older son and the father that is very important to understand when we think about what Paul is trying to teach us in Romans chapter 2. So we're going to look at this almost like a play unfolds in two acts. The first act is going to be just focusing on the younger son and the father. And in this, I want to draw that first truth that we read out from Romans chapter 2 verse 4, that it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. The, the emphasis there is that God is taking part in the way that we come back to him in repenting and he's actually in front of us. He's leading and he's guiding us. And we see that in this relationship between the father and this young rebellious son. So let's just get right into it. It says in verse 11, a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. This is something that I'll, I'll point out and reemphasize what we already looked at, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 says that those who are on the outside, the Gentiles, the immoral, the irreligious, don't have an excuse because what may be known of God is manifest in them, but they suppress the truth. And I love the way that this is such a clear picture of sometimes how that happens. The truth is, is this younger son does not have an inheritance due to him yet. His father is still alive. The inheritance should not be given to him. And until the father dies. That's the culture. The truth is, is that the father is to be honored and to be thanked. And the culture would say that it would be a slap in the face to the father to say, give me what is mine now. I don't want to have to deal with you in my life anymore. It sounds very much like suppressing the truth about God, turning your back, and living a life however you want. That's what's happening here. He wants the stuff, and he wants to leave. He doesn't care about the father. He cares about the stuff, and he wants to do what he wants with us, with it. Sounds very much like instead of worshiping the creator, they focus on the creature. There's a disconnect. There's a suppression of truth happening. What does the father do? There's another way we can parallel Romans 1 here. He says, Father, give me the portion of my goods that falls to me. What's the father's response? It says, so he divided to them his livelihood. I think this is sometimes where we want to insert where repentance needs to happen. Can it happen there? It would save a lot of trouble to the rest of this story if the father could do something to change his mind now. If the father could say, you've offended me, this is wrong, you're offending the value system of our culture, this is not how it works. But instead, the father says, here you are. And in Romans chapter 1, time and time again, it says the wrath of God is revealed against unrighteousness. How? That God gave them over to their vile passions. He gave them over to their debased thinking. He let these people who had suppressed the truth and turned their back on him do what they wanted, and their consequence of, of their choice would be his wrath. This is what happens so often for those of us who are wrestling with who God is, what God's will is for our life, how you want to respond to that. God is not going to force you to follow him. God wants you to follow him because you love him and you're obedient to him. But if you choose to live outside of his grace, he will let you do that. And oftentimes, when we talk about a need for repentance, more often than not, it's a need for us to pick up, to be picked up from the mess that we've made by our own choices. And so what happens? 
as the Father says, you are free to go. You are free to take the violation of our relationship and this culture and do what you want with it. In verse 13, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to that far off country, and wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all there arose a severe famine in the land, and here's where I underline this, and he began to be in want. There is a moment when you get to make the own choices with what you want to do with your life. There's a moment when you turn your back on the will of God and start choosing your own destination. You start choosing how you want to use your gifts and your talents and your passions. And there's this small window when it seems like it was a good idea. It's like, yes, I'm so glad I got to choose the relationship that I wanted, and I pursued the pleasure however I wanted. I spend my money how I want. I, morality is something that I kind of decide, my own code, and all of those things. I'm so glad for my freedom. But then what happens? If you've ever gone down that road, for those of you, some of you need to think back to that. Some of you are walking down that road, so take this as a warning. You will come to the end of that road. There will be a time in your life when the decisions that you've made outside of the will of God for your life leaves you in that famine land and in want. It's when the broken heart settles in and it says, man, I, that relationship was such a bad idea and now I'm heartbroken. What do I do now? The way that I used and spent my money and thought about all of my own things first have left me depressed, confused, annoyed, broken. What do I do now? I'm in want. That's what sin points us to, the warning, the memory of that. Now, sometimes before repentance happens, there is the plan B of sin. Have you ever been there? Look at what this, this young man does. So he finds himself famished with no money. He's lost everything. So what does he do? He went and joined himself to a citizen of the country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. So he gets this job feeding pigs, and his plan to kind of maybe rebuild his life says this. In verse 16, he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. He's now eating pig food. He's now in a place in his life where the only job he can get is he's getting some of the scraps from the animals that he's feeding, and, but no one gave him anything. That was his plan, but you can't even get that. The plan B will eventually fail. The plan C will fail. The plan D will fail. The beginning of repentance is when you finally stop trying to make it work in your life outside of God suppressing the love that he has for you, the goodness that he has for you, the good plans that he has for you, continually trying to find that next thing that could make your life work until finally, in verse 17, it says, when he came to himself, he came to his senses, he remembers that there's a father that's a different kind of relationship than being someone's hired hand in a foreign land with no rights. And this is what he says. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I'm hungry. I perish with hunger. I'm going to arise. I'm going to go to my father, and I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. Here's the idea. I'm going to go the other direction. I was in a far-off land, and I've wasted everything. It's time for me to go home. It's time for me to finally go back to the place where I know I might find a little bit of favor. Now, this is the first inch of repentance, remembering the goodness of God, remembering that there is something more to your life than the way that you've been wasting your passions and the things you've been pursuing. But remember, this is all in what we look at this younger son. This is a picture of how God leads us to repentance. This is not a picture of how someone has to figure out their way home, their way back into favor, their way back into status, their way back into livelihood. He has taken the first tiny inch back to the father, and now the father is going to take over. God leads us. It is God's goodness that draws us, that brings us back to himself. And as you think about what that looks like in this story, the story is actually building up until this point. Jesus has already taught two stories under the same theme in repentance. When Paul says God's goodness leads us, it is his kindness that draws us into repentance. We get this picture of this very gentle and kind and loving way that God is bringing us back to him. And it, it kind of violates a lot of the ways that the religious template is set in our minds. 
Sometimes we think that the, the wrath and the anger of God will finally become so apparent and so real and so immediate and so dangerous that we'll do anything we can to avoid it, and God's anger will be forcing us into a relationship with him. And sometimes messages of repentance can seem heavy because they come across as if God is so mad at you that you better figure out a way for him to change his mind. But Paul says, and Jesus says, what we're about to see is that God is working he wants to be part of the process. He's leading, not just leading, but he is going after those who are lost. I want to look at those two previous stories that Jesus already told. He'll give us a better picture of the character and the heart of God in the process of bringing someone home. First, the story of a lost sheep. Jesus is trying to explain the, the process of repentance, and look what he says. He says in verse 4, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when it comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep. There is a picture in this that puts all of the energy and the motivation, not from the one that is lost, but from the, the person, the shepherd, who is the victim of something that he is looking for. He wants to find it. He wants to go after it. He wants to celebrate when it's found. It doesn't sound like repentance, but it is. I say to you, Jesus, in verse 7, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sin sinner who repents. There's an analogy or a picture, a parallel being made of the way that a shepherd will go after sheep and a sinner who is repentant. The sinner is being found. The sinner is being sought after. The, the, the next story, a coin. What woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp? She's looking. She sweeps the house. She's desperate, and she searches carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends together and says, Rejoice, I have found the peace that I lost. The goodness of God is leading us to himself. Those stories are building to this. The master stroke of the way Jesus wants people to understand the heart of God, bringing people back to him. People that were afar off, who have offended him, who have wasted their lives. And this is what Jesus says in verse 20. And then this young man arose and came to his father. But when he was still a ways away, a far way off, he hasn't made it home yet. The father saw him and had compassion. And he ran to him. And he fell on his neck and he kissed him. Do you see the picture? The father eagerly waiting and the moment he sees this son, he runs for him and you get this picture of him taking him back to the household, walking back with him, celebrating. This is what the son says. The son said to the father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now the, the, the lead up to that says the son was a far way off. And I think he was far way off in distance because we get this picture, the, the, the father running after him, meeting him in this land to bring him home, to fall on him, to love him, to kiss him. And I think he was afar off in the way that he thought about his relationship with his dad. He was, was going to throw himself at, for mercy just to, get, just to get his foot in the door, just to be a servant. I know I'll never be your son again, but maybe I could be your servant. And this is why the father has to lead him in the repentance, because that's not the restoration the father wants. That's not the restoration the father is looking for. It says, The father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and a sandals on his feet. And bring him the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and be merry, for this is my son. He was dead and is alive again. He was lost and, lost and is found. And they began to be merry. God has to lead us back into repentance back into relationship with him because we're so far off about the depth of the love that he has for us we come gingerly tenderly thinking maybe if there's a god or someone up there I, I don't know how to approach them maybe i could just be a religious person work my way up it reminds me of anyone who's gone through our legal system i talked to someone last week who's on probation and you get this sense he committed a crime indicted condemned his name is on the list he's not worthy 
to be in the society that we are a part of until he proves himself. He said, I'm so excited. I've only got 75 hours of community service left. If I, if I stay on track and if I don't break my parole, I'll finally be off of all this stuff. You got to work your way back in. We want to see that you're committed. We want to see you working hard. We want to see that you're not going to mess up. And sometimes the way that we, we think about being restored into a community or being restored into a family, being restored in the kingdom, we think of that. If I could just work my way back in, clean myself up a little bit. I'm not worthy. I'll just be a servant in the household. And the Lord leads us all the way back into the, what he sees in us. You're a king. You're a son of the king. You've been bought with a price. I love you. And I'm going to rejoice over you. There will be a celebration in heaven because of your salvation. And so here's some application for this. Real practical stuff. Some of you might be younger sons among us this morning. Some of us, you may feel like you're ways off. Distant land. You came here and you feel like you're on the outskirts of what we're doing and worshiping and reading the word with hope and rejoicing and joy. Here's the message for you. God has led you here by his kindness and his love for you specifically. He is so happy that you're drawing near to him. He wants to cover you with his love. He wants to celebrate over the moment that you say, I want to be your son. I put my faith in you as a good father. Be welcomed in. Don't be timid. Don't be afraid. Don't feel the weight of your own repentance. God is bringing you into relationship with you. He's provided a way for you to be made justified, worthy to be called a son or a daughter because of his perfect sacrifice by his son on the cross. Accept that free gift and be welcomed in. For those of us who remember that moment in our life, happy Father's Day. This is the moment we celebrate the goodness of God who wasn't happy with us just slowly coming into his presence based off our own goodness and our own standards. We never would have qualified. But he said, you're a son. The moment that you put your faith in my son, you're in. The second application is, this is the picture of reconciliation that God offers us through his son, Jesus. Corinthians says that Jesus is given the ministry of reconciliation. That he's the one in our lives that has come not, not just from a house to a distant land to find his son, but from heaven to earth to find those who are lost, to welcome them in, to bring them into the household of God. We put our faith in Jesus and we're called sons and daughters. And then Corinthians says, and he gives us the ministry of reconciliation. If you have rejoiced in this moment in your life, if you've experienced the goodness of God that brought you back from a far-off land, brought you back from wasting your life, brought you back from, from feeling that, that moment of unworthiness, condemned by your past, he brings you in and he celebrates over your salvation. He says, now, be a part of that ministry. And this is the template of God's reconciliation power. We ask the question a lot. We, we, how do we repair a broken relationship? How do we get people to to where we disagree or we're far off or where, where we, we feel some alienation in our household or our family and our friend group, how do we win them back? How do you win a husband or wife back? And the, again, the kind of the, the default template, we see it the way it's played out in our culture, is to win them in our righteousness or our rightness or our anger, where we are the ones who have been offended against. Wife, you made me mad. I'm going to show you all the ways that you need to reverse steps and, and satisfy my anger. Say, say sorry, say, do this stuff. In our culture, it's like, this is what I believe. You need to defend your point. You need to tell people why you're right. You need to convince them that they're wrong. I get the question, what about a lost son or daughter? I just want to see them welcomed home, or I want to see them loving the Lord again. Here's the answer. The, the, the way we win people, the way we turn people, the way we see people going from lost to being found is kindness, and it's love. It's the long-suffering patience that never gives up on anyone. It's the thing where you get one opportunity to, to be with them or to serve them or to love them, and you give them everything you can. And over time, your kindness will win them over. Your kindness will repair a marriage. Your kindness will take a child that was distant and bring them forward. How can we be loving people? How can we display the, the heart of the Father's love towards this lost son who ruined his life and he threw himself and said, welcome him, I'm celebrating you. How do we do that for each other? How do we do that for the people that we love, that we want to see turned, going away from God, brought back home? Kindness and love and patience. It is the answer of the kingdom. It's the way that we live. We, we, we will win our lost loved ones. Now, 
the kindness of God draws us in. Isn't this a beautiful story? The beautiful story of how someone was so lost, and yet he never lost the love of the Father. The Father sees him and welcomes him home. It ends so perfectly. They kill the fatted calf, and they start to celebrate. There's joy. It sounds so good. And I think maybe that's why sometimes the story ends here. It'd be a great way to end the story. But this is two acts. This is only intermission. So we go scene, intermission now. The story's not over because we have to do act two. And act two is the point of the parable. Act one, as beautiful as it is, is showing us the heart of God towards those who are far off. And it's also going to reveal something in the heart of people who watch that process happen. Here's what happens in act two. Act two, enter older son. If we understand act two of Luke chapter 15, the parable of the lost son, we will understand Romans two. And this is what happens. Remember where Act 1 left. We have intermission, break, after this amazing party, cue the final song, cut, curtain, we take a break and we come back, and now, verse 25, enter the older son. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. And he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come home. And because he has received him safe and sound, he's alive and he's home, your father has killed the fatted calf. The music and the dancing that you heard is this amazing celebration that's happening for the brother that no one knew the status of. He's alive and your dad's celebrating. Verse 28. But he was angry and would not go in. What? What? Didn't we just have a beautiful time in the scripture to reveal the heart of God for those who are lost and this amazing thing that it tells us about the way God brings us back to himself? Where is there any room to be angry? Where is there any room to not go in? This is the point of the story. And to understand this, we go back to the beginning of Luke 15. Why is Jesus talking about repentance in the first place? In the beginning of this chapter, it sets the stage for the heart behind these stories that Jesus is telling. So I'm going to read verse 1. It says, Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him, and the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus spoke these parables. The heart and the audience of this is directed at religious people the heart and the audience in Romans chapter 2, God's goodness leads us to repentance, is directed at the moral people of the book. What does this tell us? When we think about repentance and God drawing us back to himself and his goodness and his kindness being the source for all of it, it almost sounds like an evangelistic message. This almost sounds like the whole story is about this lost son and the hope that any one of us far off have to come back to God, he will accept us. It is true. But the heart of the story is directed at the religious people who were complaining and they were mad and they didn't understand. See, in in Luke 15, you'll miss it if you read it too fast. It says that the sinners drew near. They were already with Jesus. They were coming to hear him. They were coming to fellowship. They were coming to understand who he was. And it was the religious people that were far off. Now that should blow our minds because this whole thing looks like the prodigal of the lost son is about the one who was far off in the distant land. But the real lost son is the one who was so close but didn't come in. Look at, we have our fourth example of the way that this this story or the the collection of these stories is going to have the heart of God in the way that he pleads or tries to draw people to himself. And where is it finally? You almost miss it. It's in the older son, the moral and the religious son. It's the son that had always been there. He says he would angry and not go in in verse 28. Therefore, the father came out and pleaded with him. There's the heart of the the kindness of God, the kindness of the Father to say, come in, join us in this celebration. But he would not go in. Here is the point of the story that Jesus tells. The religious people of the day were so close, but they never went in. It says in verse 25, he was in the field, and he came and he drew near. He's getting closer. He can hear the celebration happening. He hears the music and the dancing. He's informed that there's a celebration thrown by the father for this lost son. He would not go in. So close, 
but did not go in, and he remains lost in his disconnect with the heart of the father. See, it is so obvious to see the need for repentance in the younger son. He's rebellious. He's turned his back. He's left. He needs to come back. He's disconnected from the father. But the real disconnect is in the older son. The disconnect for the heart of the father. The father wants everyone to be together. The father wants there to be joy for this son that's been found. The, 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 the father wants there to be a merry celebration. And the older son says, I won't have any of it. He's guilty of the real crime here, the, the crime of wanting the stuff without the father, wanting the, the inheritance without the relationships. And, and, and now we have the older son guilty of the same thing. I don't care about what you want in a celebration. I don't care about the joy and the merriment that's being had right now. I care about what, what I feel is right for me. That was supposed to be my stuff. I never got any of that stuff. Now, here's why this is so important. When, for, the, for the majority of us, we're very close to God right now. We're close. We're drawing near. We are the second older son. Most of us have been around. Most of us go to church regularly. Most of us listen to the sermons and process and worship. And the real danger is that we would draw close but never actually go into the presence of God. The danger for this is in Romans 2 and Luke 15 is that people who think that they're good at being religious and that's enough miss the whole point. They miss the actual goodness of God leading them into a relationship with him. And it's something we have to talk about because the, the system that we belong to can get us so close. But this is not the end of repentance for how God is drawing us. He's not drawing us to be faithful churchgoers only. He's not drawing us to be the best informed people because we listen to sermons every week. These are all good things. He's not drawing us only to know worship songs by heart. He's not drawing us to understand how to participate at a church. All of these things are, are drawing us in. The end has to be a real relationship with the Father. Sometimes we are really good at the other stuff. We live in a Christian nation, and, it, and we do church so well. There's a thousand that you can choose from, either in Boise or online. The, the danger is, a question we have to ask, are we more concerned with the preaching or the source of the truth? Are we more interested in the songs and the style and the way may, they make us feel or actually entering into the presence of God? Are we more interested in the church stuff or are we more interested in the Father? the head of the church, the one that this is all about. We can come so close, and it's subtle, so we miss it, and we can forget to get to the celebration, the joy and the merriment of knowing the Father. He wants to celebrate. He wants us to take part in the celebration of how he's bringing people from around our city into him. We're, we're celebrating. It's the goodness of God that leads us, and it's the goodness of God, not our own that causes repentance. What are we standing on? What are we standing on in our pursuit of God? We cannot let it be just the church activity stuff. And it cannot be all of the ways that we stayed home and faithful to be a servant waiting for our time to shine. And the question of goodness has to be answered because that is the problem in this older brother's heart. He says in verse 28, he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, These many years I've been serving and never transgressed, never messed up a commandment, but you never gave to me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as his son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf. I'm better than him. By my judgment, I deserve more than him. I've done so much. Here's the danger. If we look at our own goodness to try to understand the reason that God has drawn us in and blessing us how he chooses to bless us, we will be left angry because we'll find someone else that we deserve more than and we'll probably be on the outside of the celebration. We probably will draw near, but we won't go in. It is the goodness of God, not our own, and the answer is found in the younger son. Verse 21 the son said to him, and said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy 
to be called your son. Now, he doesn't know how much the father loves him, but he's right. He approaches the father not based off anything that he can offer. He's not worthy by his inheritance. He's already broken that. He's already taken that. He's already rejected his father as if he was dead. He's not worthy based off his standing of what he did with that inheritance. It's all gone. He's not worthy on his morality and his faithfulness. He has lived a prodigal life of sin. He stands 100% unworthy of the father's love. There is nothing else he stands on except the goodness of the father. Whatever the father does in his own goodness to accept him back is his only hope. And what does the father say? But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet. This is my son. That's why we celebrate the father in heaven who loves us, not based off anything we've done. We stand with nothing to offer him. We end with this, verse 31 he says to the son, older son, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours, but it is right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother. He was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. It is right, God says, for me to be rejoicing over those who are truly found. It is right for me to love and encourage others to love that your brother is alive. And here's the test in our lives. Do we share that heart of the Father for our church, for our families, for each other? Can we celebrate the way that we're being drawn into the presence of God, not based off anything that we've done, but because God is good, and he says it's right to celebrate when someone is found. He says it's right to celebrate when someone is given life. We, will, we, we want to take part in the celebration of heaven for what God wants to do in this city, to bring more lost people to be found. If we stand on our own goodness, we'll be left upset and on the outside. If we come to him with nothing, he enters in and we celebrate with joy. And so we have reason to celebrate. He, we enter in based off this good father that we believe in. He welcomes us in. Every one of us now has an invitation for this last song to cry out to the Lord and say, God, you are good. I am free from the pressure and the burden of trying to earn my worthiness. I let it go. I stand proclaiming nothing but what you have given me because you're a good father. I stand not on my righteousness, but on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You made him who knew no sin become sin so I could become good in your sight. And that's why we celebrate.